Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Aaron Woodrick, the Director of the Domestic Policy Program at the McDonald Laurie Institute. We're very pleased to be hosting you today for this, uh, what proves to be a very uh, interesting uh, discussion on the issue of protecting free speech in the age of social media. And to do that, I'm joined by very two uh, eminent experts in the field. We have with us Conrad von Fickenstein, a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute, and Peter Menzies, Senior Fellow with the McDonald Laurier Institute. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Um, we've got about an hour to chat about uh, this topic and, and other related topics. Um, but of course, before we get to questions of which we have uh, many, both my own and from the audience, I wanted to give you both uh, just an opportunity to give some opening remarks to sort of maybe frame the discussion um, you know, touch on some points that you think are, are important uh, with this issue. And, and if there's time or we'll get into it in the meet, uh, a little bit about the paper that you've written, um, sort of laying out a framework on how to deal with, uh, with these thorny issues. So um, I don't know, we want to start, uh, Conrad, perhaps with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this whole area of uh, harmful contents, you wonder why it's be presented in this way. There has been no draft bill. There has been no green paper. There have been no discussions. The government issued a, a, a technical paper, which when you look through it, is very detailed and very lengthy. And it sounds like somebody has already drafted a bill or has a bill in his mind and is now asking questions on the basis of this bill. I don't understand at all why we use this approach. Obviously, nobody defends any of the five harmful contents, child pornography, terrorism, violence, hate speech, or disclosure of intimate uh, photos. But why these five? Why were they put together? They all already are subject to criminal sanctions. But this bill tries to establish a regime for civil sanctions, to go after them, to take them off, and to find people who don't take them off. Why are they put together? And uh, uh, frankly, in my mind, terrorism is something quite different than the disclosure of intimate for, for, for pictures. Why do we need a civil uh, restraint for terrorism? Terrorism is something horrible and should be fought and we have criminal law for it. I don't know why you would find somebody for advocating terrorism. You know, <laughs> either he is a terrorist or isn't. I just don't get this. And secondly, as I say, the whole uh, approach, the four institutions that they propose to uh, uh, create it has, is not being explained. There's no background to, uh, to it. And I think it's totally the wrong way to approach a dynamic, evolving field like the Internet. If you want to deal with this, you have to deal with something that dynamic is based on how it actually functions and makes it meaningful and uh, useful for everybody. And you also need a threshold. You can't just have it applied to anybody. You don't want to have to bother with small little things. I mean, you should start with 100,000 users or whatever number you want to pick. But to throw this out openly without any background and then asking for, for feedback is, I think, not the way you should approach the very difficult subject. Yes, yeah, some, some interesting uh, points there that we're going to have to get into. Uh, Peter, maybe we'll go to you. Yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity here too as well. Uh, I thought it'd probably be useful to start with uh, a little discussion around some history on this. Uh, uh, on this, the, All the talk that seems to come from the government is about, oh my God, propaganda, oh my God, disinformation. This is all happening on the internet. We have to do something about it. And, and it, it all comes without the context that, yes, propaganda and disinformation is happening on the internet but it doesn't go on to finish the sentence and that propaganda and disinformation has been going on for a very, very long time, basically since the time when leaders uh, for their own purposes wanted to influence public opinion um, in a certain way, wanted to drive anger against uh, 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 a, a war opponent. I mean, the, the British used it in the, very much so in the early days of the First World War to ramp up recruitment and that sort of stuff. We've used it for we're our thoughts of what the good guys are, right? And people that we've, uh, our opponents have used it. Uh, it's been uh, forever uh, used in terms of that. 
the second in the Second World War, Churchill had a daily propaganda briefing. You know what what did Lord Ha Ha, who broadcast uh, from Germany, an Irishman, to to the British Isles every day? What did he have to say and have a counter um, disinformation plan? Um, Churchill used his own disinformation. People dropped leaflets telling people that soldiers had, you know, been defeated or had um, uh, surrendered, etc. This has always gone on. Now, I get that the concern is with the internet that it happens so fast, right? The internet happens so quickly that it scares people. But I think what people forget is while disinformation can get out and spread on the internet very rapidly, so can the countermeasures, right? So, so can the counter spin or whatever it is that you want. And, you know, when you get into this, what is disinformation? You know, I mean, boy, oh boy, oh boy. I mean, politicians themselves are a pretty good source of disinformation from time to time, you know, about <laughs> what somebody else said and what somebody else didn't do. And it's, it's kind of funny to listen to them talk about, oh my goodness, there's disinformation going on out there. So anyway, I thought that would be kind of a good place to start. And that's, one of the things that we, you know, with background decisions we made about the paper and that the paper is to look, use, if you're going to use it, have any legislation, use it to preserve and protect free speech, but also use it to focus on the big companies, right, who are, have pseudo monopoly, if not full monopoly positions, right? And once you get into that, you need to keep, you obviously need to keep your eye on them, you know, have a monetary threshold which you deal with them and ensure that they conduct themselves responsibly um, through their own codes of conduct, which would be approved by a regulator and that sort of stuff. I think we've created a very sensible um, regulatory structure that uh, uh, minimizes harm and maximizes uh, uh, security of uh, civil rights, such as uh, free speech. Okay. Well, maybe we can uh, explore that a little bit more, Peter, and then I'll go to, back to you, Conrad. Um, if, if you could sort of sketch out what you see the government's approach as being and how the approach that you and Conrad in your paper, what, what are the key differences there? What is it that you think about your approach that um, d sort of strikes the balance better between, uh, you know, dealing with these harms, as the government puts it, and, and protecting free speech? Well, I mean, it's hard to say specifically what the differences are because the government hasn't introduced any legislation on online harms yet. Uh -huh. But the rhetoric around it has um, was certainly last year. Right, we're going to bring the hammer down here. Right, we're going to we're going to bring an end to this. And then you use these five horrible things um, against which there are already laws to protect us from. Right, and I mean, a, a cynical approach might be that. Well, they're using that uh, as the Trojan horse within which they can smuggle other things in that they right. that they really want to do, right? And that you know, if if uh, if somebody opposes them, you can turn around and say, "So you're in favor of child pornography, right?" You know that old sort of bait and switch right. uh, type of routine. But I, I'm not actually sure, and this is one of the problems with it. What is the problem you're trying to solve, right? I mean, there are problems with uh, big tech companies. There are problems with Facebook that involve privacy and data collection and monopoly position and all kinds of stuff like that that, you know, do need to be, uh, you know, addressed in terms of that. And Twitter and, 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 and that sort of stuff in terms of their competitive position, right? So I think what we're trying to do is clear the air a little bit mm -hmm. and try to give any proposed legislation, some focus that sort of says, what are you really trying to do here? Which I don't think they're they're clear on. And what we suggest is what they should be really trying to do here is focus on responsible behavior of companies in dominant positions. Okay. Conrad, any thoughts? I agree with Peter, but I've put worded slightly differently. I think the 
we have a conceptual approach. Number one, we say is you are not just a telecom company. You're not just transporting. You have a responsibility for it. You are quasi a telecom company. You're also having content and you are responsible for the content. And secondly, the content that you carry is not yours, it's other people's. It belongs to the user and you have a responsibility to the user and uh, with regard to that uh, information. You know, uh, we, we try to analyze uh, an, an, an analogy to banking and saying you have a fiduciary duty for the information that you carry, etc. And if you start from that basis, a, conceptually, you're quite different than what the government. The government says there's illegal content, let's go after it, let's punish it. And we say, no, 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 let's talk to uh, about these media companies and instill in them these two responsibilities. And then if, if this question is, how the, do they discharge this? How do you monitor it? And how do you make sure that they do it properly and then nobody gets hurt? That's our different approach that we suggest to what the government's doing. Okay. Um, I guess to, to, to clarify then, is it, would you think it's fair to say, uh, Peter, that your paper is an attempt to sort of reconcile, I mean, these are private entities, private businesses, but at the same time, there's the public square argument, right? Like there is an, uh, there's online discussion, there's a, there's a discussion going on that impacts the public. Uh, there's public discourse that increasingly takes place in these platforms. Um, and so uh, while they're not, um, while we're still understanding that they're private businesses, you want to impose uh, additional obligations on them that reflect the fact that they have this, I think as Conrad says, sort of fiduciary duty. Um, I guess the question I have then is if, if we recognize the public square argument, doesn't that open the door to the idea that it, that is where the government really needs to enter to sort of regulate content. And what is the, what is the concern? I mean, if we have to pick between who's going to regulate the content uh, people may not trust the government, they may not trust the platform itself, how do we sort of square that circle? How do we make sure that um, we're not having either the government or the platform sort of be overzealous in policing the content that appears on the platform? Well, yeah, I mean, the, as private companies, they've been able to create their own rules of engagement when you sign on and the cost is for free, right? There's, there's, there's no real transaction there financially, but there is a transaction that you agree to the terms and conditions, right? So you agree, even though nobody reads them, um, you, you nevertheless agree that you will not uh, post uh, pictures of yourself naked on Facebook or Twitter. And, you know, Facebook has its sort of uh, nipple rule and, and, and those sorts of things. So there are guidelines in terms of what they've been able to do for themselves. As they've grown, they've grown into relatively dominant positions, though, which kind of creates a, an additional duty of care. I guess, and and one of the one of those duties of care is, if you're going to regulate speech, and they do, right? You you know they're 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 trying to protect people from getting bullied and harassed, and it can be severe. The swarming that can take place on there, the deplatforming, uh, the consequences of that um, are really really nasty, right? So that's one of the things that 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 you want to go after, right? Is making sure they protect people. That there's that they have codes of conduct that prevent people from being swarmed, that allow people to, uh, you know, build walls and and I mean some politicians now you you can only respond to something they say if they follow you, for instance, and those sorts of rules. The government's role, I think, should be largely uh, restricted to overseeing those, making sure that perhaps with those large companies that there's some sense of consistency between them, but understanding the nuances of their individual business models, but also making sure that they don't use their platform as a bully pulpit for one type of politics or another. I mean, this has always been one of the, one of the roles of regulation in terms of uh, radio and television in, 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 in the history of their is preventing an individual owner um, or an individual <laughs> baron, I guess, in, in some kind, from taking this asset, which has monopoly control, and using it to pursue a right-wing agenda or a left-wing agenda or a, this agenda or a free market agenda or a supply and demand or supply and control agenda, right? To make sure that they now have 
that they accept that once they're in this position of power, they have a great duty of care to be fair, right, and balanced. And the government oversight that would be provided, at least in our suggestion, is to make sure that they do so and in a very transparent way. Okay. Um, Conrad, is it a, is this partly a, a question of resources? I mean, you're both obviously former, uh, you're former chair of the CRTC and Peter's a former vice chair. Is it a question of resources? I mean, is it just sort of a hopeless uh, cause for government to want to micromanage content on these platforms? Is that the reason that it's better to have the platforms themselves manage this? Because it's just not something that the government uh, has the ability or the resources to do? Well, I'll, I mean, any kind of regulation, what you try to uh, do is achieve the best result with minimum resources, obviously. And here we're talking about a very advanced technological field on the, where the private sector that you are, that is running these companies has far, far vaster resources and technical expertise than the government. Mm -hmm. So the what we are suggesting is don't try to get in there, don't try to uh, deal with artificial intelligence or algorithms. Mm -hmm. That's not your name. You, you establish what the outcomes are you want here. And then you ask the company, You, this is your business. You develop a code which achieves these outcomes. And that's and we will monitor and we'll make sure it does, et cetera. And there will be other people who complain. There will be complaint mechanism and everything, et cetera. But the basic scheme is, well, this is what we want. You are... We regulate you only to the extent that, is, that, that we want to have these outcomes. You find the best place, and if you fail, we will tell you, and if necessary, we'll find you. We may even take you off the air with court, uh, court uh, approval if that is necessary. But on the whole, in all of these regulations, the least directive you are, and the more you give uh, freedom to uh, the regulated to, uh, to, conduct, to devise a method that achieves your goal, the more effective it is and the less resources you need. And, you know, what we basically have used is this model that the Australians have very successfully uh, implemented, and they call it, by this oxymoron expression, mandatory voluntary codes, which is basically <laughs> says, go and adopt a code, and the code should con con contain these and these outcomes. And we'll look at it. And if you don't, we'll impose one on you. And what happens is every company says, oh, I don't, I don't want you to impose. Here's my draft. And then you talk about their draft and you talk to what extent has to be adapted or not. Right. And, and that's a fairly common tool in uh, with laws, right, is that you give a, a business a, an opportunity, for example, with articles of incorporation, you can pick your own. But if you don't, there's a default set that the government will apply to you. So that's that's I, I'm I, I think fairly similar. I guess maybe I'll play devil's advocate a little bit uh, when we talk about the government's dictating what the outcome should be and leaving it up to the business to sort of arrive at that outcome. What do you say to those who say there's a risk then that platforms will uh, err on the side of being too aggressive uh, and sort of limiting speech more, not because they have some agenda, but because they figure it's just safer to err on the side. They don't want to tick off the government. They don't want to get these bad outcomes. So they sort of err on the side of being more aggressive with policing speech um, because they just don't want to get in trouble uh, with the authorities. Is of course a risk you're quite right but if you you also put in an appeal mechanism that's anybody who's being curated or is being taken off the air or or told they have to change their, their has an ability to to dispute and appeal and we specifically provided that a lot of this is going to be done by computers on the basis of ai and AI is not a very good way in order to deal, especially hate speech and nuances, and is this ironic or is this actually meaningful, et cetera. So that we say, yeah, you can, there is an appeal mechanism, you can work it out, et cetera, but then if you finally come to the conclusion, this has to be, it has to be looked at by human eyes to make sure that this is indeed something you're not, uh, not is being taken off the air of by overcautious AI. And of course, then there's a peel mechanism to the social media responsibility council who can say, no, no, that you over aired, et cetera, put it back on or not. So you build that in, hopefully it will not really, 
result and what you suggest some overly cautious play safe approach and i'm not terribly worried about it because you know that as well as i and we've heard testimony from facebook and others the more controversial your content the more more viewers you have so there is an incentive not to over be over cautious because it will hurt you at the, in terms of user and in user interest that's a very interesting uh, point that I, that I don't think has uh, been raised enough, which is that if there if there's an incentive uh, on the side to please the government, the countervailing incentive is, as you say, there is a strong commercial incentive for them to still invite speech that might not cross the line, but is maybe we'll want to call it spicy uh, speech because it's it's uh, it's good for business. Um, yeah, I think Aaron, Aaron on that just to pop in on that one in that it, this appeal mechanism thing I think is a really important feature that. Conrad mentioned, and it's really that you have a regulator in, in essence who is, you know, has insisted that these companies have these codes of conduct, right? But when it comes to appeal, the regulator is not the prosecutor um, in this sense. The only thing the regulator is going to prosecute is the companies for not being in compliance with their own code, right? Right? For 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 showing an imbalance or um, misconduct is too strong a word in, in terms of that. But I mean, I. I don't want to abuse an analogy, but it, like I said, it's it, it's more the citizen's defense attorney than it is the citizen's process, you know, the the crown attorney um, in the in, in this scenario. And that's, I think that's a fundamental difference between that and the original concept that got rolled out in the um, public policy forum paper led by Rick Anderson, where it was, you know, we'll have a digital safety commissioner and we'll have 24 hour takedown notices and and boom, 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 and we'll be patrolling the web to find out who's doing this and that sort of stuff, and we'll be intervening. And there was no due process in that. Yeah. Right. There was nothing at all. Right. It was. It was, and it was rightly pilloried um, when it when it went out, uh, you know, for feedback on it. And that's why they're doing even more feedback on it because, um, as Conrad was saying earlier, they're not really sure why they're doing this. They've got these five things, and they've walked halfway down the road now twice. And now they're pausing again to sort of say, what are we doing? What, uh, where are we going? Yeah. Right? What are we doing? Um, you know, all of a sudden they found out uh, how many mines, you know, how big a minefield they've stepped into when it comes to preserving rights. And this idea that, you know, by regulating you can preserve rights is not entirely without merit in a sense. But um, and to just to add to your other point, too, in terms of the size of the task, that's why we've carved out the size of the companies that should be dealt with because it, it just, and, and that also preserves innovation. I'll shut up for a minute now. Uh, um, I mean, I, and I think it's important then to destroy the, you draw the distinction between the government policing all the content that appears on a platform and the government sort of policing a platform's commitment to uphold its own uh, its own internal code, right? That's a lot easier thing to do because right. you're only dealing then, the government only has to measure specific instances against the code and see, you know, did you comply with this code rather than them as this sort of the public policy forum paper sort of, the government will be watching all the time to sort of leap in and uh, and demand takedown of content, which I mean, I'm not sure people appreciate the scope of the number, like the millions and billions worth of, uh, you know, posts and tweets and videos and stuff that we'd, we'd see. So I think it's uh, it's uh, you're biting off uh, a lot smaller uh, chunk to chew. But I, I want to come back to something you said earlier on, Peter, which was um, you mean, you highlighted the fact that propaganda, misinformation, this isn't new. It's been around since time immemorial. Um, you know, of course, as you also pointed out, because of the internet, the argument is this has changed the game. It has um, allowed these things to spread uh, faster, quicker, everywhere. Um, I, I guess to go the other way, I'd ask you sort of like, do we, do we need, does government need to regulate this at all? I mean, you, you've obviously proposed some form of regulation. So it seems to me you're both conceding that this, this issue needs to be tackled. Um, what do you say to the people who say that... Um, it doesn't matter whether it's government or it's the platform. There's still there, there's really no way to do this without uh, trampling free speech. So is it is is the problem? And it goes back to something else that Conrad said at the beginning, which is, you know, on, on what basis are we doing this? Is there is there hard empirical evidence that the nature of the problem we have? I think most people feel there's a problem. Is it that serious a problem that we need to have um, a regime, a formal regime to deal with it? 
Well, I mean, a good starting point is like is to ask that question, right? And and I think it's the responsibility of the people bringing in the legislation to articulate the problem, the exact problem that they're needing to address. I mean, as I said, there there are issues around the uh, uh, the internet and the dominance, and it's not really around the internet so much, I guess, as the dominance of some of these companies in terms of uh, competition, the amount of power they have, the amount of influence they have. Um, if they were to get into curating content, which they generally avoid, they, they have like set standards, but they're, they're not publishers, right? They're, they're the whole idea of a user generated content it still seems to puzzle government and, and a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of old school media. So, I mean, you can, there's a reasonable argument out there that in terms of content, there should be no regulation, right? You can, you can still make that argument. That said, um, everybody is regulating it. And even the companies themselves are saying, look, it's gonna be a lot easier for us if we could just deal with a bunch of, if we could understand what the expectations are, right? From the public and through the public and that sort of, and that sort of thing. So Twitter gets beat up because it takes, you know, bans this person as opposed to this person. And why, why did you take this person out? You know, when people are fighting on Twitter to get each other blocked on, you know, banned from Twitter and, the, and that sort of stuff. So. It's, it's a battlefield like that. So I think we got we eventually got to the stage where commerce developed to the point where commerce itself was saying, okay, rather than getting beaten up constantly and having one set of rules in one country and necessarily in one set of rules in another, um, just tell us what you want us to do <laughs> and, and, and give us something so that we have some certainty for our shareholders and our investors into how we can move forward. And I think what we have proposed I think is precisely how you can deal with the concerns, the legitimate concerns that that, that are raised about uh, you know the um, the reputational harm that people try to inflict on each other online. Um, that the companies can 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 mitigate that, but at the same time keeping it at the center of it, that the the core purpose is the preservation of free speech. Well, not the only core purpose, but the but the but what we tried to do is build something. This is how you preserve free speech, while making sure you protect the public feels protected because it's the public that this is about from the most uh, heinous aspects of the internet. Yeah, it, you know, and I think you uh, have a good answer to my question about why regulate, and if the answer is a lot of these entities want something precisely because they don't want to be guessing they want to have uh, certainty going forward and so uh, you know the model you propose uh i think strikes a balance between you know th there is a regulation component from the government but a lot of it is still leaving it within the hands of the platforms to sort of execute so i think that's a that's a reasonable trade-off that i think a lot of platforms could live with um you know conrad i wanted to ask you uh because in your paper Sorry. Can I just finish on this one? Because I think you're missing, only talking about half of the coin. You're all talking about the discipline, the taking down, etc. We also say these codes have to be approved by the government, first of all. It's not just that Facebook dreams something up. No, it has, you have to. And it has a strong portion also about the user's right, because the, what is being put, what they're using, the data, is actually the data. If you, if the, user's data, which it gives to uh, these companies. And what, why regulate not only to prevent abuse, but also to prevent, in effect, give users some control over the data and how it can be used, and et cetera. And that's a very important yeah. portion because right now, all of the, if you've, so far, we've only talked about the abuse of the data, but there's also the protection. And the, I want uh, stuff, you, you're misquoting me. I have a right to, to protest and say, you can't, and correct it, you know, and that sort of thing. All of that is, mis is missing. So the code, as we propose, it will encompass all of that. And that's why you regulate both in order to protect the data of the user and then also to protect the misuse and, 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 and the fabrication and, and, and you, uh, inciting violence and whatever. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. That Makes perfect sense. Um, I wanted to ask also, Conrad, about, um, um, you know, in your paper, in terms of the entity doing the regulating, as I mentioned, you're both former uh, former commissioner of the CRTC. 
you know, is is because the internet is so different uh, than TV and the internet, um, you propose a new entity to do the regulating. You don't think that the CRTC is sort of up to the task, or do you think it's the nature of the task here is so different that it requires a, a completely different regulator? To, re to answer two reasons why the CRTC is and Number one, it was born as a broadcast regulator, and to this day, broadcast is the number one concern nowadays. They never really have grasped the internet and have seen themselves as, the, as somebody who's dealing with the internet. They see themselves as a broadcast regulator who also does telecom. Secondly, the people who are there appointed are appointed by governor and council on criteria that I have never understood and has never been made public in this nowhere. What we wanted to do and what we said here, we will need three people, three people who really understand the technology. We want three people who understand rights and we want to put, put three judges, reform, retired judges in there so they can make sure there's due process and they look at these things in the proper form. And that's by specifying the type of people that uh, should be on the Social Media Responsibility Council. We hope to, we will achieve a knowledgeable and fair dis uh, resolution of disputes. Now, I don't think the CRTC, the way it is right now, can do it. And, and you know, institutions have a cultural uh, heritage and it's very hard to shed it and, and this is really quite something quite different than what they've done in the past and so therefore we suggested no let's deal with it this is the internet this is a new world it's the center of our new digital age let's have the proper body concentrates on it and made up as i said yeah no exactly just to back conrad up on that it's like it's been frustrating to watch this process where you think you can regulate the internet by amending the broad something called the Broadcasting Act and giving control of it to something called the Canadian Radio Television uh, Commission in terms of that. Like you, people have to get their heads around the fact that the internet is an entirely new technology. Um, it uh, requires an entirely different um, frame of reference. And uh, as Conrad said, institutionally, you get your own culture. This gives an opportunity to build a, a, a culture specific to the needs, um, a council appointed with the skills required for the needs. And uh, you know, there's no way the CRTC could, could do this without considerable institutional reform. I mean, Ian Scott, their current chairman, gave a speech the other day that, that, that said, you know, we can do this. Well, we're going to use the tools that we've used for the last 50 years, <laughs> which is just kind of like jaw dropping, right? You know, because it, it's like such a giveaway that you think that the tools you used for the last 50 years are going to be good for this one, right? It's, yeah. uh, that's, I mean, what a giveaway. <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, when you think about it, the fact that, uh, we've just, it just was sort of assumed when this topic came up that the CRTC, would be the one to deal with it is in itself a mistake, right? Because the internet, while there are elements of things that take place on the internet that um, appear similar superficially to like broadcast radio, because you know you can access news, you can play videos. It's fundamentally a uh, multi-way medium, right? Whereas radio and TV is there's a you, you know you, you as a user receive. Uh, stuff, um, all, you know, you listen to things on the radio, you watch things on television, but the internet is completely different in that there's there's user participation in all these platforms. And that's, of course, what's giving rise to all of these new concerns because we didn't have that before. So it is yeah, it's it's an open question. Yeah. Um, I wanted to sort of touch on, because uh, you touched on this in your paper, uh, Peter, some of the, well, how are other countries dealing with this? Obviously, Canada is not the only one that has these concerns. You know, what are some, are there any lessons we can learn from other countries, like what to avoid or what you think is working fairly well and maybe what inspired any of the, uh, the solutions you proposed in your paper? Well, I, I mean, there's, there's multiple different approaches and it, it depends on the outcomes you want, which, what you prefer. Um, because, I mean, you've got everything from, you know, Iran and China and North Korea. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's maybe of, stick with, uh, stick know, with the liberal democracies. You can, but yeah, you can start point. there, but if you want to go into liberal democracies, I, I think the ones, the, the, the ones I think with the best chances of success are the, are the ones when you get into the, what we would call the current Bill C-11 type of thing, where you're dealing with online streaming and that sort of stuff, the ones with the most success there are the ones who are focused on money, making sure that there's continued investment within their country from 
offshore streaming companies, right? So in France, it's making sure that there is, um, you know, uh, that, that the French language and French creativity continues to flourish and doesn't get overwhelmed by a sort of foreign invader and that sort of stuff. Canada's kind of got a long tradition in terms of that. So that's where you look at. But the most successful models aren't trying to regulate the entire internet through it. It's like making sort of commercial arrangements with these with these large companies because if, if what you need is money you know for your for your domestic companies then just go get the money and and, and stay away from that the ofcom uh british one is 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 pretty interesting in terms of it goes quite far uh more far farther than certainly i'm comfortable with in terms of uh creating a new set of harms you know that it kind of gets into hurt feelings and that that troubles me a lot because it's so it's uh, so subjective. Um, it's almost like the uh, the new version of Bill C-36 that's come out with a redefinition in Canada of, of what hate is, which people should start paying more attention to. Um, but at the same time, Ofcom has been really vigorous in restating its commitment to free speech in a way that I would like to see Canada do more, right? I mean, talk about defending free speech, right? Talk about specifically defending it and then addressing your specific harms. Canada's kind of, you know, iffy on that, right? It's kind of like, well, oh, yeah, it's in the charter, but you know, yeah, there's stuff on there we don't, yeah, and, and that's that, that's kind of creepy. Um, but anyway, in, to make a long story short, in, in terms of when it comes to the creative sector, if you want money, the, the, the best models Canada should follow are the ones that provide um, revenue for their domestic companies with the least amount of interference in innovation um, that still allows people to flourish on YouTube and TikTok and that sort of stuff um, uh, and defense free speech. That's pretty much it. Okay. Um, maybe we can uh, talk a little bit sort of uh, you know, more broadly about the freedom of speech issue. It keeps coming up. That's obviously one of the you know, reasons that you've written this paper. I, I guess I'd ask you, Conrad, like, are you more concerned right now about, um, you know, the government doing too much and and squelching free speech? Or do you think that, uh, do you worry that they're not going to do enough uh, to sort of deal with the problems that they uh, that they continue to highlight um, as a justification for these, for these, uh, these, uh, this legislation? Well, <clears throat> I find now, I can't understand our government's approach. I mean, I go start from the point of view of saying we live in the digital age. The center of the digital age is the internet. And let's concentrate on it. Let's make sure we can exploit it to its maximum because it's a phenomenal source of innovation, but also has some dark sides and we make sure we contain it. We've never done that. We've never had a royal commission on it or concentrate on it. We pick out little areas and deal with it. You know, we've picked out broadcasting and we're dealing with that uh, now. Internet harm is another one that we're doing, etc. And I don't understand this. This, this. this seems to be no guidance or no overall concept. It's also all coming from her Canadian heritage. I would have thought it actually should come from uh, from uh, from industry, because it, it is such a tremendous source of innovation. And then, secondly, uh, free speech is obviously a huge part of it. If we are there, but it's not. It is some whatever you do when you regulate. You want to respect the charter as much as possible, and free speech is obviously a key ingredient of the charter. And every regulator always worries about how can I find the right balance here. There is something here; it is so bad, or it's it is offensive, whatever. We have to deal with it. But on the other hand, I don't want to work and encroach the charter, and I don't want to respect uh, deal with people uh, or restrict people's personal freedom. And that balance is not very easy to uh, when you then go come to something like internet harm, to isolate this specific aspect, etc. It is front and center there. And you have to address it. And that's why we said with Peter and I said, look, if you're going to do this, if you think internet harm is something that has to be singled out and dealt with uh, the internet, with all the facets, and deal it today, then for God's sake, make sure that you're not only doing going on the on the side of restricting and fighting harms but you also have to make sure that you don't 
pound on free speech that you take away and yet it used to make it quite clear that people have a right to speech, have a right to their data and find the proper balance between the two. Peter, any Peter? thoughts? Well, no, I mean, I like the, uh, the the way Conrad described, used the analogy earlier about this is sort of like how, you know, the way banks are regulated, right? Um, your banks are regulated to protect the people whose money is inside the bank um, in, in terms of that sort of stuff. So if you're going to, if you're going to start regulating, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook and, 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 and those companies, you're regulating them to protect the people who are, who are actually, who's not just their data, but it's their, it's their content, right? Their content is the equivalent of the banks to their cash, right? They're, they, they, they're actually the ones who are contributing to the financial success of the companies you're talking about, right? If none of us went on Twitter and shouted at each other, or if none of us posted pictures of our grandchildren on Facebook, they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't, they, they don't have an audience to, to enjoy and to make money from, right? So uh, this model that we've created is really centered on the owner of the content, which is the citizen, right? Um, in terms of that, in making sure they are protected from that, not um, you know, that their content is protected in that regard and their rights and their speech because it's their speech that creates the opportunity for these companies to make money, right? Like that, that's the tricky part when you talk about it. Like for these companies, like it, it, they are incented, yes, to perhaps, you know, there is that incentive that you talked about earlier to perhaps over-regulate, right? Um, in anticipation of fear of some sort of government uh, sanction, right? But at the same time, they're de they depend on people sense that they are free to speak their minds in, you know, to sustain their business model, right? Um, like, it'll be interesting to see Twitter's response now that Elon Musk owns like 9% and, and is a free speech absolutist. And he's on their board now, his, apparently. And he's on the board. Well, you, you own 10% of something, you're going to be on its board. Um, uh, th that sort of stuff. But from a business perspective, you know, suppressing they have no business interest in su suppressing free speech right they have a business interest in not being deemed to be a publisher and a promoter of harm and i mean civil actions can take care of a lot of that stuff but to, just to go back to the beginning it's really just if people try to think about it as this is a s similar in spirit to you know bank regulation and and why banks are regulated you know why you have deposit insurance and and those sorts of things um I want to go back to something else you said earlier too, Peter, about you, you had a concern that, you know, sort of Canada is not being vocal enough about defensive free speech. Like you mentioned how at least, at least Ofcom in the UK, you know, they may be going further than you like, but at least they seem to be quite vocal about the importance of free speech. Do you think that that's uh, a particular problem here in Canada relative to other places? I mean, uh, obviously it's, it's in the charter. Most Canadians, if you ask them, will say they support free speech, but do you get the sense that, in 2022, there's a lot of buts, more buts after that. I, I support free speech, but, um, and if so, is that justified because the internet has sort of changed the game in terms of what's harmful and what we need to worry about uh, being harmful? Or, you know, as you say, are there, um, there's already laws to deal with these things and it's just a matter of um, updating the remedies we already have to, to meet the internet or do we need new categories of speech that uh, you know, we need to be worried about and, and, and completely new tools to address with the, to address those new harms. Well, I mean, I, I can recall being at the CRTC and from time to time you'd have these discussions about the discussions would rise about the appropriateness of certain content with broadcasters. You know, there was a, there was a, a, a sort of watershed hour after which uh, you know, before which certain content shouldn't be shown. And it, it actually only applied in Ontario and Quebec um, because of time differences. It just didn't apply elsewhere. And, you know, the, the response from broadcasters was generally, well, if people don't like it, they can turn it off, right? <laughs> um, you know, it's not an illegitimate argument. I don't like this program. I'm not going to watch it. 
I don't like this. I, I don't like the fact that this network showed this program, so I'm not going to watch it. Yeah. People are free to make decisions, right? There, there's a there's an aspect of individual freedom that needs to come into this. Um, if you are afraid of what will happen to you if you go on Twitter, right? Do like 90% of sensible Canadians do and don't go on it, right? <laughs> Like, and, I mean, and, and this is more plausible now, right? This is more plausible now. And, yeah, politicians and media populated. I mean, the purpose of Twitter is really to influence media um, and make them think that this is what most people are thinking about today. So they will do that and and, and that sort of stuff. But, you know, what, what is it? 20% of Canadians have some sort of, you know, uh, have signed into Twitter. But on an active daily basis, the percentage is pretty small. So you can protect yourself from Twitter by just, not going on it right um in, in in terms of that sort of stuff it's 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 like you know if, if you want to feel safer um when you leave the show at night don't walk down a dark alley um in in, in terms of that sort of stuff there are think the responsibilities that people can take on for themselves um re regarding these sorts of things so but in, in terms of the the, the longer the, the free speech discussion from our government I think they've kind of boxed themselves in politically, right? Because they've made a lot of noise about denouncing this, you know, and people use the word hate very loosely these days, right? So much hate, right? Like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, the Calgary Flames lost last night. And there's so much hate about that. Look at all the online hate, right? And we're, we're reusing, redefining words um, that actually have important legal meaning. Um, and, and getting into that and and then the government you know talks about denouncing this speech and that speech and hate and we're we're opposed to this so they've kind of boxed themselves in in a way where they've been so they've almost put themselves in a position where you know they're trying to say that people who are in favor of free speech are in favor of hate right, right? and they're and you know free speech is pretty messy right like I mean, the, the whole idea of free speech is that you have to tolerate a lot of stuff that you don't like, right? Yeah. Um, but that's because it protects you from saying what you think, which other people don't like, right? And that transaction needs to be spoken about more frequently. And it's, uh, I mean, the, the idea that if something is, if you come out and condemn something is terrible and hateful, but then refuse to ban it, it's uh, it's now sort of the line's been blurred to say, oh, well, then you must be okay with it because you haven't banned it, right? And so I, I wanted to ask you too, because I know you'd written a piece about the, with the war in Ukraine, obviously they, the government has banned um, uh, Russian propaganda, RT, um, in Canada. And while, you know, most people aren't shedding any tears over, you know, Putin's propaganda arm, you raise an important point about the precedent that it sets and is, you know, maybe it's an, maybe it's easy today because everybody, you know, hates Vladimir Putin and he's the bad guy. But what if down the road this, you know, you start to apply this standard a little more loosely, where do you stop and what do you, what do you ban and what do you allow? Yeah. Well, a year ago, they, they, they had somebody appealing that they should ban uh, CGNT. I think it is the Chinese government uh, media and the CRTC refused to do it um and it generally it's right like it it sort of avoids um you know getting into that sort of thing in this case i think the mistake that was made with the the crtc banning it is that it should have just been treated as a sanction um instead of getting into the specifics of what frankly was a pretty loose legal argument um in order to to do what what uh, the heritage minister wanted which was to ban Russia TV because people were upset that it was being on the air without, but it was only on the air if you subscribed to it. <laughs> like it wasn't it on the air. It was, it was available on cable for people who wish to subscribe to it. So um, yeah, I mean, it's a propaganda arm. There's, there, there's, there's no little question of that, but whether people should freely choose to uh, listen to it or watch it and, uh, not do something else. Like, uh, like I noted in the in the article I wrote, the first thing that happened when Pablo Rodriguez said he was going to ban this, right? Or he, he was going because he can't legally ask because he can't legally ban it. He was going to ask the CRTC to review it and that sort of stuff. The next thing you saw in his Twitter feed was people saying, "Now do Fox." Yeah. Right? <laughs> 
And, and as far as I know, you can, you can still access like the Russian propaganda on the internet, right? So I mean, you've cut off the you've cut off the TV channel, but really, if someone who's really dedicated to getting their daily dose of of Russian propaganda is still going to be able well, to here, get it. here's the interesting thing in this, in the terms of the broader discussion and the CRTC's decision on RT. They said, as for those worried about free speech, don't worry about it. It's still available on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. here, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Conrad, I wanted to ask, um, since uh, you know, so much of the insight that uh, we rely on from you two is, is both obviously because you spent time on the CRTC. You know, I wanted to ask you about the CRTC and what they're not doing right now that they could be. It seems to me that uh, the CRTC is being uh, tasked for things that they're not fit for purpose for the reasons you've already outlined. Are there things that the CRTC should perhaps have their time better spent on right now that they're neglecting in favor of these things? Well, it took them three years and they still haven't made a final decision on the internet wholesale. They, they have not at all. Uh, on MVNO, you know, mobile virtual network operators, they came out with a decision which basically favors only people who have have already got some spectrum. And they're not doing anything to, I think in this day and age, well, when we all know, especially with COVID now, access to the internet is vital. It is actually something that you need. You really need it to be informed, to be a, a for your personal conduct, for your business conduct and everything. And really that's what it's all the effort should be. And you're making make sure that we have as much import as uh, access at ex uh, affordable prices and not have three companies dominate the field and basically set the rules and keeps the others out and do absolutely everything to facilitate access and facilitate uh, competition in that field. But no, they're worried about television. You know, they were worried about uh, uh, RT, you just mentioned now, and they, they, they can't wait to get Bill C-10 on their time in order to deal with streamers, etc. Yes, that is part of the responsibility, but that's not where the main action is. I think the CRTC should really focus on the internet and make sure it is competitive and there's multiple access, and they haven't done anything meaningful in that way in, in quite some time. Yeah, that's interesting because there is an infrastructure and uh, sort of affordability uh, things that CRTC could be seized with, but instead the, the focus is all sort of on content when in fact, as you say, uh, the platforms themselves are better positioned to deal with the content issues. So yeah, another case of, of, of time not spent on uh, not, not keeping your eye on the ball. Um, Peter, I wanted to come back to you on, um, on codes of conduct again on sort of, uh, you know, the idea is the under your paper you know the platforms come up with the codes of conduct the governments uh sort of approve them what are you seeing right now in terms of platforms are there any platforms that have codes of conduct or develop developing them or anything that you've seen that is better promising um that you see as sort of fitting with with what your paper proposes i know the government here obviously has not set up this exact regime but do you see platforms moving that way anyway like are they already to, to an extent they can do it themselves anyway with, without having um you know the government approval on the other side so i did, i just didn't know if there's anything out there that you would cite yeah no they, there's there's companies do it they do it already with their you know their you know you're in violation of you get you get warned or you get banned to be off twitter because you're in violation of our of our Trump code of, you know basically uh, I, I, i'm not sure if they use the term exactly code of conduct um and and here it is. You can go and read it. This is how this is how the 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 standard of behavior that we expect you to do in terms of you cannot abuse people racially. You cannot blah blah blah. Uh, Facebook has gone a a step farther in the past year, and they developed basically their own sort of appeals commission, their own oversight body, right? Uh, that which they, you know, um, lots of you know sort of you know snickering about how independent can that be, right? When uh, this huge corporation, uh, you know, assigns you this task. But the very first report they came out with, um, you know, criticized Facebook for a lack of transparency in uh, uh, in its approach to why people were taken down, or where, where, you know, why they were, 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 why you were taken, to, why Aaron got cut off Facebook and Conrad didn't, um, and, and and that sort of stuff. And and they also actually it, it illustrated 
um, that body. Um, and it's interesting to follow, right, some of the issues they deal with because they act as an appeal body too, right, as an internal appeal body with certain issues. But the volume of issues that they're dealing with is just, you know, in the first quarter, they had 250,000 issues to deal with, right? Complaints or something like that. So the idea that, you know, that, that public policy forum group came up with that somehow you could create this digital safety commissioner who would be patrolling this and making decisions and doing that um, in any sensible way, or I mean, the volume of staff you would have to have them, um, it's just unimaginable, right? But it, but you look at the companies doing it themselves, they can still, because they can hire tens of thousands of uh, uh, people within their, if they needed to thousands anyway, within to people to, to moderate and make judgments on this content uh, is significant. So they are doing a lot on that themselves. I mean, one of the things, you know, our proposal creates is is somebody who oversees the overseers in terms of that and makes make sure that, that that's all done fair. So there's some reasonable models evolving because the companies have a business interest in making sure that people feel safe in their space, right? People, you know, people used to go to Facebook because that's where you found your old high school buddies, you know, you know your old high school girlfriends or your old, you know, university roommate and, uh, and that sort of stuff. You posted family pictures and pictures of your grandkids, and then it became more political. And people start dropping off and they go to Instagram, right? Um, most people don't like to be in a room full of shouting, right? Um, unless you like shouting, and then that's all that's left. Well, unless, yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I think there are certain market incentives that are moving things in the right direction as well. That's an uh, interesting point. I, I, we've only got a couple of minutes. I wanted to put one last uh, question to you both about a uh, related issue. Um, it's to do with Canadian content and the government's, government's sort of initiatives to sort of protect Canadian content. Obviously, a smaller country like Canada, we've always taken a sort of uh, a bit of a protectionist approach to ensuring a certain level of Canadian content, whether that was on TV, on radio. I guess sort of just wanted your broad thoughts on, you know, is this same approach viable when it comes to the Internet? Do we have the same kind of uh, content concerns? And can the same type of regulatory approach where you set sort of quotas and minimums, is that going to work in an online environment the way it works for uh, radio and TV? So, Conrad? The, no, it's a short answer. You can't do it. The, uh, in the broadcasting world, you had a spectrum scarcity. You, things came over the over the air or later on over cable. And you regulate it and you said, you can only put something on there unless you, have, you play by these rules. You, you need a license and you need to do A, B, C, D. You need to spend that money, etc. And, and we were very inventive. And we created a whole regime and we created a lot of good Canadian content, no question about it. But now that you have the internet and anybody can go on and put it, etc., it just doesn't apply anymore. Streamers are, you can still squeeze them in because essentially it's you are there, you want to see a film, you just now decide at the time you want to watch it. Rather than the appointment television, you want to watch it at 10 o'clock at night or something and you have the option to do it. But you still have to be a subscriber and you have to pay. And we can say, yeah, well, of course, if you stream, you're in effect, we treat you like a broadcaster and therefore these rules apply. And that's what C10 or C11 now is trying to do in a very ham-fisted way, but that's what we're trying to do. But apart from that, what's going on in the internet? How are you going to occur? How are you, what, what, what framework are you going to force people to adapt? They don't need your permission to go on the internet unless you want to res uh, have a regime where they say nobody may go on the internet in Canada unless they do ABC and if, <laughs> If that's not no no internet service provider in Canada is allowed to carry you, you don't have this controlled environment. So therefore, this whole model of broadcasting doesn't apply. Pretty uh, pretty definitive, Peter. Yeah, no, it is, and I mean Conrad mentioned this earlier. So I I mean that you know like what are we even if you back this up a bit right and think about it here we, it's the year is 2022, we have this brand new technology. 
that is forming the foundation for how we do our business, not just our broadcasting and our speech, but our commerce and our healthcare and our uh, our, 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 our education system and that's and that sort of thing. It's huge, right? It has a, a huge commercial impact. It's the, uh, you know, the pro probably the primary transportation network in the country, right? In addition to railways and 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 airlines and and highways and that sort of stuff. That this is where our commerce takes place these days, and we are trying to regulate it through the Department of Heritage, through this really narrow broadcasting lens right like it's crazy there's they, there was an opportunity here when they did the broadcasting and telecom legislation review panel and there were some good recommendations on telecom and and institutional reform for the crtc in there but the government didn't care about any of that stuff all it cared about was broadcasting right this broadcasting thing so now we have the internet i mean going through heritage i mean and and I mean, broadcasting is a part of the internet, you know, things that are yeah. similar to broadcasting is a part of the internet, but a really, really small part, right? It's like this thing happening today about online, you know, Facebook and news companies, right? News is a really, really tiny part of Facebook's business. They're not really interested in it, right? And that sort of stuff. But we're doing, so we're doing everything wrong. It should be through, um, I said. Right, and that should be through a Canadian Communications Commission. That's primary concern is uh, what it always has been for telecom um, uh, communications networks in Canada: access and affordability. Right. I mean, it's it's been that since you know the Board of Railway Commissioners um, started doing this sort of stuff, and that should be its focus. And and this content manipulation is frankly a a really sad distraction from where we should be going as a country and and looking for how Canada can use the internet to succeed rather than why Canada should be protecting itself from the internet. It's sad. It's all sorts of digital first broadcasters or people that we call them broadcasters who are using the internet very successfully internationally mm -hmm. without any government support, without any uh, systems uh, regulating them or, or favoring them, etc. So the ingenuity of Canadians is immense. And if you speak to them, they say the last thing we want to do is be, reg be regulated. Yeah. Yeah, imagine that. They're doing okay even without government support. Who yeah. would have guessed? Yeah. Um, that can be pretty scary to governments. Yeah, <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to feel uh, unneeded or unloved. Okay. Um, listen, it's been a. This has been a great chat. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining us today, Peter Menzies, uh, former CRTC vice chair and senior fellow at the Donald Laurie Institute, and Conrad von Fickenstein, who's a former uh, chair of the CRTC and a senior fellow at CD Howe. Thanks so much. Uh, their paper uh, can be found on our website, mcdonaldlaurier.ca. Um, and thank you to our viewers for joining us, and we will catch you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks.